Hi everyone. Uh, my name is, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Steve Penner. Uh, I am the assistant debate coach at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in upstate New York. Formerly a debater uh, for the University of Toronto, more commonly known as Hart House or Hart Hoos, if you really insist on making fun of the Canadian accent, uh, and one of the DCAs for Mexico Worlds 2018. So as part of the build-up to this competition, we're putting together video seminars uh, that will hopefully build up some knowledge or institutional memory uh, of things to improve on or how to think ways to improve uh, before Worlds. And so the thing I'm going to be talking about today is how to prepare for Worlds, how to get ready, and hopefully how to uh, do so in a way that is time effective uh, and that puts you in a position to do well. We we'll go over a number of different areas, uh, but I guess let's jump right in. Uh, first of all, picking a partner. Um, different institutions obviously select differently. Um, some societies you'll bid as an individual, some societies you'll bid as a team. Um, but even in societies where you bid individually and then the selectors pick your teams for you, uh, there's usually some, not always, but usually, uh, some metric for expressing who you would prefer to debate with. So it's worth thinking about uh, in any event. And I think there's kind of three areas that you should think about when you are selecting a partner. All of this, of course, assumes that you have choices, uh, that it's not a question of, well, who has enough money to go to Worlds, uh, which is the case uh, for some people in some societies, and that's uh, unfortunate, but uh, discussing for the sake of people who do have options uh, what their criteria ought to be. Uh, the first is what I would describe as speaking compatibility, right? Are you both whip speakers that don't, that haven't extended before? Uh, are you both, you know, usually second speakers so you don't have a lot of experience giving a model? Kind of seems very obvious to people who've been to Worlds before, but or have done a lot of debating before. Uh, for people who are newer, you want hopefully to have a variety of different experiences uh, in speaking positions. Uh, this can be picked up, obviously, over the course of the next few months or the next five, six months uh, before Worlds. Like, you know, it's not like you can't become a good whip speaker, uh, but it helps if you're starting out and you just have one person that naturally extends well and one person that naturally whips well. Uh, that's going to um, put you at an advantage, obviously, uh, as a team. Second area, probably more important in that it's kind of harder to fix in four or five months, uh, is knowledge overlap or knowledge compatibility. Uh, it can be very tempting to say, oh, I'm going to, knowing, knowing someone, uh, someone that knows a lot about IR, a lot about econ, I'm going to partner up with somebody else that knows a lot about IR and a lot about econ, and we're really going to crush those rounds. That'll be great. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, and the reason is that the additional value of you know, lots of expert knowledge in a particular area is much, much lower uh, than the value of having a pretty good baseline level of knowledge about a lot of different areas. Uh, and so people with different outside interests or different academic interests, certainly, uh, studying different things, will usually, again, these are all kind of trade-offs, uh, but will usually have more success uh, at Worlds. Again, like speaking positions, you can take steps to fix this. You can expand your reading horizons. You can look at different things uh, in the course of the next five or six months. But kind of all else equal, I think you'll be better off debating with somebody whose interests and knowledge bases are not exactly like your own. Uh, so you complement each other rather than overlapping uh, and getting little benefit. The third, those, are the, those are the two that people usually talk about. The third one that I want to mention uh, somewhat briefly uh, is personal compatibility. Uh, if you think about it, you're going to spend hopefully some of the summer researching and working together on building a matter file or at the very least um, knowledge about the world. And then you're going to spend something like eight weekends, five, six, eight weekends, traveling with this person prior to Worlds, and then you're going to have to spend, you know, we try as best, we, we will try as best we can to make the experience uh, as pleasant and painless as possible, but what certainly has the potential to be three rather long and miserable days uh, with this person overcoming some adversity, uh, and that has the potential to uh, go quite badly. I've seen it happen where people start speaking to each other by round nine before, uh, and that's not fun. Uh, so ideally you're going to be friends uh, with the person that you're going to Worlds with, or at the very least you'll be able to get along uh, in that kind of an environment. 
Uh, and I think that's something that is people often kind of overlook. They get very jazzed up about, I want to get the best debating partner that we will, we're both really good debaters, and we're going to go win worlds, it'd be great. Uh, that your chances of winning worlds, even if you are a very elite team, are like no better than 1 in 20, 1 in 10. Uh, and that's like if you're the top, top elite team. Uh, and so, you know, the experiences that you're going to have, the, you know, hopefully enjoyment that you're going to get out of the experience will be much better if you are debating with somebody whose presence you genuinely enjoy. Uh, and so I would kind of advise that you select people or, you know, preference people uh, in selecting partners uh, who you are friends with, who you uh, will enjoy spending four or five months in the build-up to Worlds debating and practicing with. So, that's that. Uh, now, obviously I've already kind of mentioned you're going to want to read um, and hopefully learn about the world a little bit, do some research uh, to improve your ability to have, I guess I should take a step back. Why is it that's useful? Um, obviously, it used to be the case, certainly more so five or seven years ago, uh, that we would have what I describe as fuck you IR motions, uh, which is that it's just about this thing, and if you don't know about this thing, you're going to get a four. Uh, or you're going to be in a debate where nobody knows anything about, uh, for instance, try to pick one that happened back when I was a novice. I, I don't know offhand. Uh, but, but some relatively obscure topic uh, where the CIs are just like, you need to know about this, and if you don't, you should lose, ha ha ha. Uh, and, you know, a lot of, that was quite unpleasant for a lot of teams. Uh, and so the evolution has become uh, that we try, I mean, obviously some of that will still happen, there are still events going on in the world that we think lots of people should know about, uh, but the threshold for how accessible those events should be, obviously also with the advent of info slides, has become somewhat lower. So you're less likely to get a motion that you literally know nothing about, and there's been no info slide. But lots of debates are going to have areas where the ability to produce relevant examples from around the world, uh, the ability to bring in analysis from different columnists or writers or thinkers, uh, from around the world is going to be really useful. Uh, and those are topics that are certainly still being set. Um, you know, there's certain, just to obvious example, uh, the Thess World's final, lots of potentially useful examples of revolutions that have succeeded or failed and how good they've been uh, for the people living under them. The motion's not explicitly about, for instance, Cuba or China or Russia, uh, but, you know, there could be some useful in information brought in uh, from those examples. So that's kind of why I think uh, it's to your advantage, to know, in addition to just being like a good citizen and knowledgeable person. Uh, in a debating specific context, uh, that's why I think it's probably useful to uh, have a wide knowledge base. So where should you get that? The first and most obvious, and in some ways contentious source, uh, is The Economist, uh, previously known as the Debater Bible. Uh, it did not get that title by accident, but there's been a lot of, especially recently, pushback of, like, the economist is biased, the economist has a view, the economist is not uh, all it's cracked up to be. Um, and I think that's a useful remedy to what may have been an overabundance of, or an overexuberance uh, towards the economist. It is certainly true uh, that it is written from a Western perspective, from a sort of right-of-center technocratic perspective. That's all true. Um, but there are a bunch of reasons it became sort of not authoritative, but a, a, a widely read uh, source for debaters. And that's because, I think, a number of reasons. So first, uh, it does actually tackle a lot of its subjects in greater depth than do other sources of popular media. Right? You'll tend to get somewhat more informed writing uh, than you will perusing the front page of a tabloid or even your kind of garden variety newspaper. Uh, there are obviously a bunch of newspapers for which that's not true, um, but you know, some on each side. Secondly, uh, and I think perhaps more importantly, uh, it makes an effort, again, imperfect, admittedly, from perspective, admittedly, uh, to cover most of the world uh, in at least some depth on the major issues that are major at that time. I'm going to admit that I haven't uh, cracked open a copy in a few months, uh, certainly not since the school year ended, but it is just the case that you will find stories about every corner of the world, or at least lots of corners of the world, every week in The Economist. Uh, and so as long as it's not being oversold as like, this is all you should ever read, uh, I think it's a perfectly valuable uh, thing to look into. Uh, getting a subscription to, or you might well have it through your university, uh, some online access 
there. Of course, I don't suggest you stop there. Uh, and so what are some other sources? Well, if you're looking for content from North America or the U.S. specifically, the failing New York Times or the fake news Washington Post are probably good sources. Somewhat ironically, the more they are getting screamed at on Twitter, probably the better source they are uh, because they're hitting relatively close to home. Um, they also have, especially the New York Times, uh, some kind of global reporting, but it's not as, it's relatively more limited than perhaps, uh, to use a British example, the BBC, uh, which does, I think, is fairly widely acknowledged uh, as doing a reasonably good job um, of at least attempting, again, Western perspective, uh, to cover much of the rest of the world that we don't often uh, read about uh, as Western consumers as Certainly, a, a, that Western consumers of media do not uh, often get to read about. I don't mean to imply that everybody viewing this video uh, is a Western consumer of media. Um, speaking of which, uh, if you want, and I would strongly suggest, um, getting a non-white, non-Western perspective uh, on news around the world, one particularly good source for that, especially in the Middle East, uh, is Al Jazeera. Uh, you know, maligned by a lot of people in politics uh, in the West, but again, fairly widely regarded uh, as a reliable source uh, for news, so especially if you're looking for, quote-unquote, the other side, uh, even though I don't really think that's true of them, um, and just a balanced source, uh, I would strongly suggest taking a peek there. Final suggestion uh, that I would have kind of in the general where-to-read category, uh, and it isn't so much what you should do, but rather just like that you, could, you should be able to outsource this effectively, this rather effectively, uh, is that whenever something happens in the world, something big, uh, it blows up on Twitter. That's just kind of the world we live in. Uh, and inevitably, there are you know, a lot of, at least in my stream, Western journalists who are posting stories and whatever. Uh, but there's also usually links to local reporters who have better ideas and better information. Uh, to give one particularly interesting example of this, last summer, obviously, there was attempted coup uh, in Turkey, and a number of, uh, through basically a couple degrees of separation on Twitter, I ended up seeing fairly insightful tweets from Turkish journalists. Now, I actually, to be honest, could not tell you their names right now, but they continue, kind of, as the year has gone on, to provide what seems like relevant and incisive commentary uh, on the somewhat degrading situation uh, as regards democracy in that country. And so... Whenever something is kind of a crisis or when you're looking for information on a part of the world that is underserved by Western media, I might suggest trying to find who the news sources are quoting themselves um, and taking a look at the primary or more local reporters' feeds for that. Lastly, uh, as kind of a more useful... If, if you have, you know, an hour of time uh, at any given sitting, uh, just a short pitch for a documentary program I quite enjoy uh, on PBS. Uh, it's an American public broadcaster. Uh, Frontline does documentaries, and they have, because it's a public broadcaster, uh, accessible archives. So about five or ten years, certainly, uh, of archival footage of them putting out you know, 20 documentary, 20 hour-long documentaries a year, uh, that do something of a deep dive on a particular subject. Uh, so there's ones in there about George W. Bush vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. There's one in there I know about Obama vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. Uh, there's one about Firestone and its role uh, in some civil conflicts in Africa. And so, uh, again, obviously some of those are a little bit more American folks because it is an American broadcaster, uh, but when it goes abroad, it does, I think, do a fairly good job uh, of interviewing and getting local perspectives, uh, and certainly for the purposes of a debate, uh, it provides you probably as much information as you will need on any particular subject to debate it effectively. Uh, and so I think it's a pretty valuable, and, and they're pretty good at usually being thorough and walking through and being accessible uh, to people who don't have an expertise in the subject area, obviously because they are broadcasting to a general audience. Uh, so I, I've a lot of compliments for that program. Uh, again, you can use Google PBS Frontline, uh, and that will be available uh, online. I can get it. It's an American broadcast. I can get all of them without a paywall in Canada. I assume that's the same case uh, around the world because, again, it's public broadcast. You're not trying to make money. 
In terms of things you read, the final comment I would make uh, is that it can be useful not just to read the news, uh, but also to read the, or perhaps even more useful, uh, to read the opinion pages, or the opinion sections, columns, editorials, whatever. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's not, it's not that you get better news there, uh, but it's that you get news that's more appropriately attuned to a debating audience. In that you will not just be presented with information, people or editorial boards, which are just people, um, will be making arguments. Uh, they may be arguments you agree with, they may be arguments you don't agree with. But at the if, they, if you don't agree with them, think of why they're wrong. And all of a sudden you're doing rebuttal in your head. Or if you, you know, think their argument is very persuasive, you, know, you might want to you know, make a mental clip uh, and try to use that yourself. And so I think it, it's, if you're going to have like 20 minutes to read the New York Times daily morning email uh, blast of headlines that you can get. Uh, I think the most valuable 20 minutes of that will be on the opinion section, not in the news section necessarily. Um, but again, obviously, your time is up to you, but this is a suggestion. So, now that I've gone over a few areas of things you can consume, um, what is it that you'll want to know about? And it's particularly useful, although also in some ways not, uh, that we're doing this now kind of in late May, uh, probably be published in early June, um, because we don't have motions yet. Uh, so I can be a little bit freer in discussing uh, the various things that you should read, because there's no risk of my giving away any specific information. Obviously, the flip side of that is there will be things that will happen in the next six months that aren't uh, obviously covered here because they haven't happened yet. Uh, but in terms of things that are active in the world today that you should be uh, knowing about because it's entirely plausible that motions will be set uh, that have to do with these. Uh, the first, which is very obvious, I think, to most people who've been to Worlds, but not at all obvious to people who have not, uh, is that there is usually, I don't want to say always, but I think it might actually be the case, there's, at the very least, very usually, uh, a motion that has something to do with the place in which Worlds is being held. Uh, so, for instance, last year there was a debate about electoral reform in the Netherlands. Uh, in Thess, they attempted, it was a bit of a foul up, to have a motion about the Golden Dawn. Uh, in Botswana, there was a motion about the South African Development Community. Um, expect that there will be something similar about Mexico. Uh, and I will leave it as an exercise to you, the viewer, and the conscientious debater, uh, to go and figure out what those issues might be. So, that aside, uh, global areas of conflict. Debaters and CA teams love talking about war and conflict and how to resolve it, hopefully. Uh, and there's several areas, of course, of the world that have issues in that regard. North Korea. You know, will Kim Jong-un wake up tomorrow and decide to end the world? Who knows? Uh, but hopefully, you know, he won't, obviously. Uh, but that's one area of the world. You know, there's, I think, a third U.S. fleet headed in that direction uh, about now. So, potential hotspot uh, of the world that might be useful to know about. Syria, obviously, has been going on for a very long time. Uh, Somewhat tragically, there doesn't seem to be a great answer. Um, but obviously that causes both regional and international effects uh, that are very commonly debated. Uh, Ukraine has sort of fallen out of the headlines, but like Russia did legit just invade a country and take their space. Uh, and so and lots of people are affected by that, not just space. Uh, and so you know that could be a potential source of, or certainly is a source of conflict, uh, could be a potential source of emotion in that regard uh, as well. Those are kind of the, the hot military conflict spots. Obviously there's some very significant civil strife in Venezuela as a result of economic problems that are, that I personally would argue are inherent to the type of government uh, that was being put in there. Certainly lots of people would disagree with me on that. I don't need to uh, evangelize. Uh, but Venezuela's had a lot of economic trouble obviously recently. Um, there is, uh, I have a whole section devoted to Donald Trump. Uh, later, so I won't talk about that right now. Uh, second kind of big potential topic area, backsliding democracies. Places that are moving away from the direction that we might like them to uh, in terms of rights and liberalism and values and all that. Um, in the world, Turkey, obviously, I already mentioned, uh, Erdogan becoming increasingly authoritarian uh, and intolerant of dissent. Hungary shutting down or significant restrictions, I think, shutting down, uh, of the Central European University, uh, the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte doing all kinds of really awful things. He just declared uh, martial law 
in one province whose name escapes me right now uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, it seems quite bad, and of course, the thing that all the three of those have in common uh, is praise from the leader of the free world. Uh, save us all. Um, but those countries seem to be uh, not moving in the direction we like, and so one potential source of debate is how maybe to encourage them to move in the other direction, to move back uh, towards democracy. Potentially interesting source of debate. Uh, third big area that, I'm think that I've thought of is kind of global trends. Uh, so the first here is, again, with obviously some exceptions, um, maybe even largely a Western phenomenon, uh, but general social liberalization, uh, coupled with a pushback by people who don't like it. Right? This is the political, corre I hate this term, political correctness debate, the safe spaces on campuses debate, the trigger warnings for university curriculums debate uh, that has been had uh, around the world for, in the past Years. I think that's something uh, that is certainly live and relevant to particularly a student debating competition uh, that there may be topics about. The other one that I might identify is kind of similar to the uh, backsliding democracy section, the decline of institutions. You know, NATO and the EU are under fairly concerted attack or they're falling apart from the inside or some combination of the two coupled with a rise of populism. You know, Brexit, for instance, being excuse me, a uh, pretty obvious example, Trump being a pretty obvious example, uh, Orban in Hungary being a pretty obvious example. Um, people and institutions or parties rising to power on the backs of we are going to tackle the global elites. Right? So is that a good idea? Obviously some manifestations of that are not are pretty obviously not good. Um, but as a general idea, I don't think populism is without any merit. Uh, so that's potentially debatable. The specific cases of populism are potentially debatable. Uh, and you know, whether or not we want to reverse the global trend, or whether the global trend has been good or bad, uh, potentially debatable. Uh, and so that's another thing that I would suggest having some degree of interest in. Of course, much of what I've chatted, chatted about uh, that you should uh, build a knowledge base around intersects in some way with Donald Trump. It's kind of the elephant in the global room. Uh, I would suggest not getting too caught up in that. Um, as a consumer of news, as a citizen, by all means, knock yourself out. Uh, but as a debater preparing for worlds, uh, I don't think that following at real Donald Trump uh, is of any value to you at all. A uh, couple of reasons. The first is that a lot of the day-to-day -day coverage of Trump and a lot of the day-to-day -day news that he makes is inside, relatively inside baseball process stuff uh, that both is probably completely inaccessible to most of the world uh, and secondarily has very little effect on most people's lives uh, and so doesn't make particularly good debate topics. Uh, the second reason I'd suggest not paying terribly much attention to the day-to-day -day, uh, is that even on the policy side, a lot of the policies are just not debatable, right? Like, maybe I shouldn't make categorical statements, but I would have a very hard time um, if I was assigned in a debate to defend uh, a ban on people from the Muslim world that do not hail from countries with the Trump Hotel. Uh, that seems like a, a pretty indefensible idea. Uh, and so even on the policy side, uh, I don't think there's a lot of great topics coming specifically from things Trump says. That said, he obviously has a profound effect uh, on things that are happening in the rest of the world. It's not an accident uh, when he hosts Erdogan at the White House and then Erdogan's guards go and beat up people uh, in Washington. Uh, and so maybe the effect that Trump has on the rest of the world or some of the bigger picture stuff uh, is potentially really interesting to debate about. The minutia I would not get caught up in terribly much. I think that's probably... I mean, it might, it depends on whatever, how much time you have or choose to devote to this stuff. It's interesting as a citizen to follow along to, uh, but as a debater, I don't think it's terribly helpful. Finally, debating prep. Uh, and what I mean by that, where's my mouse here, sorry. Just got to scroll through my notes. Uh, the debating prep. So how to improve as a debater now that you've gained all of this uh, knowledge about the world, hopefully, how are you going to apply it? Uh, so there's a number of different ways. The first way that I would recommend uh, is to go through motions that people on the Edge Corps have previously set. So to vote, it'll probably take an hour or two uh, to look up at least a few examples 
uh, of tournaments that people on the Edge Corps have CA'd before, uh, and you will probably get something of a sense of the type of motions that we like. Now, to be honest, I have not done this um, for Mexico's Edge Corps, so I suspect uh, I I will tell you what I suspect uh, is that we come from different areas and probably have different philosophies, and so we probably set all kinds of different motions. Um, but it might well be possible to discern some kind of a trend or, or a kind of type of motion uh, that we like. Especially, um, I, I know for myself and Michael, we see a lot of stuff. Uh, and others certainly have as well. Michael's just the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, and so we would have fairly extensive uh, motionographies that you could go look through. The second thing I would suggest there um, is people often like to play this guessing game of what motion's coming next. Uh, that's an incredibly hard thing to do. Uh, even once the music starts playing, <laughs> it's pretty hard. I'm never involved with choosing music, by the way, thank God. Um, but Worlds is a long tournament. Uh, we're going to need to have, let's see if I can do the math right, nine prelims plus five, six, six 14, 17, something like, something like 20 motions. Uh, pretty close to that anyhow. Uh, and so you can expect that's going to have to cover a broad array of things. Um, so the, some of the usual categories that people look for to kind of categorize motions into, uh, economics, the environment, law, social justice or social movements, IR, philosophy, art, um, space exploration. Uh, there's a lot of different areas. Uh, in my view, and this is kind of I'm giving you one secret out of the motionography side um, for me, I, I think some of the most interesting motions are when, the, are when more than one of those overlap with one another. Uh, so you have a debate about, you know, the economics of the art world or something. Uh, and so you might try to look for things that, and not even so much to predict, but just to have examples that would interact uh, with more than one of those categories of motion. So that's kind of still a research thing. Uh, in terms of what you can actually do to get better at debate, uh, first of all, there is what I will describe as the MDG approach, uh, which is a fanatical devotion to the activity. Um, how does that manifest itself? I think it's, I don't think I'm breaking any news. Uh, he's been pretty open about this. Giving a PM speech every morning when you wake up for two years will make you a better debater. Uh, I know, that's, that's not, shouldn't be terribly surprising, uh, but turns out it works. Uh, and I think that that's something that does not take particularly much time. Uh, you know, if you do your full prep and then give a speech, actually give the speech, uh, that's 22 minutes, um, which is not that long. Obviously doing it every day uh, becomes something of a burden, but it's a way to get better. You have to think about, certainly you'll get much better at modeling. Uh, you'll get doing, doing a lot of models, um, but that's one way, certainly giving speeches yourself uh, to get better. Uh, if you live in a major city, uh, they, I believe have summer practices in vast majority of major cities. So that would be a good way to go about this. If you're kind of this, this is moving into the next category, watching the videos of previous debates online. Um, there are relatively few truly original arguments that ever get made. All right, there's only so many debates and then the proper nouns just change, right? Ukraine becomes North Korea, becomes Iraq, becomes Sudan. Right? And military and the intervener is the US or the EU or the UN or NATO or whatever. Right? And so the principles underlying those debates remains the same, even though the effects that you or the particular arguments you can make because of the specifics of different actors might change. Uh, but the principled arguments that underlie those don't change very much. Uh, and so you can find, and I know because I did this myself, it's how I made a pretty big jump between my second and third year of debating. Uh, is to spend a lot of time just watching other people who are much better than you making those arguments themselves uh, and then copying them. Don't actually copy them word for word. Um, that happened once this year. I can't remember what the tournament it was or what round it was, but I was watching a debater who just like literally started reciting a finale speech to me. It was very strange. Um, I think the person actually, uh, I, can't, I can't remember if the person did well or not in the debate ultimately, uh, but it was a very awkward 30 seconds. Don't literally do that. Uh, just, you know, paraphrase, reframe arguments and think about how they would apply to different debates uh, and then do that yourself, right? And that's something that will make you much better uh, at debate. Again, because there just aren't that many, or there aren't, well, there are lots, but 
there are not an unlimited number of new arguments that can be made. Uh, and it's very likely that for any argument you think of, somebody else, um, potentially someone better than you, uh, has already thought of ways to make it differently. And so integrating between different things that you've already heard uh, is the formation of most debate arguments. So the more time you spend doing that, the better you'll get at the activity. Um, besides just um, kind of critting arguments from people, uh, you could, for instance, if you get tired of doing a PM speech every morning for two years, uh, you could you know, start doing some LO speeches. That you prep out the first op case to a motion, watch the PM speech, and then do some rebuttal uh, on the spot. These are things that you can do if you don't, especially if you don't have a big society or a summer set of summer meetings uh, to go to. So just kind of put yourself in that debate. If you are closing opposition, what is your extension going to be? If you are closing government, how are you going to respond to that, etc. Right? I think just going through the act of thinking about debating uh, on a variety of different motions and rounds posted online, lots of them are available with various different sources, uh, is a good idea. I guess I should do a, a quick sidebar about how to find those, obviously, on if you have access to YouTube, that's uh, going to be a pretty rich source. There's lots and lots of worlds out round, lots of Euros out rounds. Not to do an infomercial for HWS, now that Michael has stopped competing, there's lots of videos of HWS uh, round robin debates from this year. I, I, I kid. Uh, Michael allows many of his debates to go online. Uh, but we got a great many requests for a particular debate, uh, and so I make that joke. Uh, finally, of course, this is like literally the final step in this, uh, there are prep tournaments. Uh, and I would recommend doing several of them with your world's partner, uh, if at all possible, prior to the tournament. reason for this kind of goes back to what I was mentioning when I talked about be friends with your partner. Um, you want to figure out how you work together. Um, it's not necessarily seamless, even if you have two very good debaters, uh, they may have diff entirely different ways of using prep time, for instance. Uh, and so the best way to figure out what way will work for you is just to do it a lot. Uh, and obviously you can do that in an internal practice, but it's not the same in a lot of ways as a tournament. There's a certain kind of flow and intensity uh, to a tournament that you can't really replicate in practice try, but it, I think that doing tournaments, there's really not much of a substitute for doing tournaments together uh, in the build-up to Worlds. Ideally, those will be kind of large competitive ones where you can you know, compete and challenge yourself uh, against some of the best debaters that your region has to offer, and that'll be a way, and, and hopefully also get good feedback excuse me, from many of the judges uh, that are going to be IAs uh, at Worlds this year. So, that is what I had. Quick recap um, for anybody who fast-forwarded for the last 32 minutes or so. Um, pick a partner you're compatible with, and uh, think about that from the perspective of speaking compatibility, you speak the right positions, that you don't overlap your knowledge bases too much, uh, and hopefully that you're friendly with one another. Uh, read a diverse set of sources, uh, hopefully reliable ones. Uh, look to the opinion sections uh, of what you're reading to have not just news content, but also arguments provided to you. Uh, try to do that reading, or do that kind of whatever you can watch video after reading. Uh, do that about a broad array of places in the world, uh, not just your home country. Canadians were very, I don't know what we are anymore. Certainly when I was debating, we used to be very famous for being the team that had the example from Canada, shockingly. Uh, and that was not terribly persuasive. Uh, so get those examples from around the world, read up on conflict zones and global trends, uh, and then, kind of final suggestion, do a lot of actual debating with your partner, or if you're not with your partner over the summer, like you live in different cities, that's fine. Um, do some work online, find videos and such that allow you to interact and see good arguments and, and try to respond to good arguments, uh, and that will all help you improve a great deal. I hope that's been helpful. Uh, obviously, I am pretty freely available and on social media a fair bit. Uh, so find me if you have any questions. Thank you all very much and look forward to seeing you in Mexico.